Hello. Hello. What's up? What, okay, what are you doing right now? What are you doing right now? A puzzle? What are you yeah. doing? Okay, well, it's, pieces. it's it's not puzzle time. It's podcast. Time. Oh, is that right now? Okay, That's I'll get on right now. Bye. Okay, all right. Hello? Can you hear me? Yeah, okay. Oh, good. yeah. What's going on? I'm ready. Jesse, Go you know, where did you find this? Must be you. You must be so excited. You know, where did you find this history guy? The history I've just seen him on YouTube. He, he's, uh, he makes just so many clever, interesting stories. I just got hooked. I watched like a whole bunch of them because he's just exploring history, but not in the way you normally would think about it. So it's just kind of a, he's a very unusual person. I quite enjoy his show. But I want to know where, because you know, I get texts from you, emails, like it's three in the morning. So what brings you to the history guy? Like what were you looking for that you found him? I don't even know. I couldn't tell you, but uh, I'm glad I found him. You know, you never cease to amaze me. That's all. <laughs> okay, I'll, well. see you, I'll see you on there. See you on there. So Lance, I'd like to introduce you to Jesse. Yeah. Jesse, this is Lance, obviously. Jesse, you're a fan. Yeah, yeah. Um, so why do you and how do you pick a story, Lance? Uh, well, uh, I we put up three stories a week, so we got about two days. So uh, the rule that I always have, and, and I write, my uh, son, my oldest son also writes, and then I have another couple of people that give me scripts now and again. My wife writes some scripts. Uh, and the rule always is to write what you want to write, write what you're passionate about. So if you're writing something, and you're like, I don't want to get through this, then pick something else and write what you want to write. Right. Uh, but very often, I have to say the topic has to be, I got to get a video up tomorrow. And which one can I get up tomorrow easiest? And sometimes that's what drives it. But we, we do go for a lot of variety and we want to talk about different things and we want to write what interests us and what we're passionate about. And so that might be something different on Tuesday than it is the, you know, the following Tuesday. And a lot of these subjects you're picking, they're not the usual subjects, then there, there are a lot of them, but I don't even know how you can possibly do the research or, or know about these things, you know? Well, we, we aim for, I mean, it's, a, for, it's supposed to be a forgotten history channel. And so we do aim to have, and some of them, uh, we get that information from someone. Uh, and some of them is just stuff you can track down on the web, just a lot of people don't. But right. like, we, uh, we did one about a little Coast Guard boat in the Weddell Sea that was frozen in. And uh, that was actually sent to me by someone who was on that boat. And they said, oh, this was just a really interesting summer. So I, in the newspapers from the time, it was maybe two paragraphs. Right. And so what he gave me, and, and then he had pictures from the crew and stuff like that, it turned out to be really a fascinating story, a lot more than you could find anything where you would have done research. So some of it is just because someone else has done that and they want to tell the story. And some of it's just, you know, if you spend enough time searching around, you'll find the, the newspaper articles, you'll find the, 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 the reports and things, and you can kind of go from there. But do you, we, we, do, you do you look through a lot of newspaper articles like, like you find online? Uh, in, especially for uh, things that go back, I mean, uh, first of all, any you know, newspapers that are you know, from the period are always just really interesting. It depends what period you're in. Sometimes they're really, really dramatic, and sometimes they're just straight to the point. But uh, I mostly do my research from home. I mostly do my research on the web. So one of the closest things I can get to first-person research, to, to, to really giving direct primary research, is to go to the newspapers at the time. And the cool thing is those are virtually all online now. They've been digitized, and so we can go find newspapers even from the 1700s. So that's where we get a lot of information, uh, though newspapers are sometimes wrong. So newspapers at the time were even sometimes wrong. All right, so that's a key point. Yes, so history, and it's is it is history impartial is history subjective so how do you go about verifying a story or particularly in the when you're going way back a couple of hundred years which you do how are you going to verify what is the do you have a criteria do you say how do you figure it out well and especially on our time schedule because i've got a couple of days to get up an episode i mean if i was writing a novel if i was writing a history book i might have years to go verify all of that so what we do is we, we do the best we can. And if there's places where there's you know, a disagreement, then we try to present both sides of the story. Uh, all history has perspective, but I can say that we have a goal. I have a goal of not having perspective, of trying to be neutral, of trying to let the, the listener decide. I know that's only possible so far. I mean, my perspective gets in there. So, so when there's a question, when you get there and you say, well, you really don't know, then we give the best that we can. And we try to tell the audience, this is why we don't know what we don't know. You know. Um, Butch Cassidy and Sundance, you know, you go back into, um, you know, it's like, there's so little of it that is, is, you know, like, you just don't know what's true, what's not true. How do you, 
even put together all those those ideas and and things because it's like part of it's like you're saying like well and somebody once heard and there was a dinner party and this and that it was you know it's like but it's mythology it's american mythology at this point yeah and if i knew the answer to butch cast and the sundance kid i wouldn't be doing a youtube channel i'd yeah <laughs> Fortune. So, uh, you know, we, again, we, we kind of do the best we can. We use stuff for that one. There's, there's several different books that have been written uh, from different perspectives, people who were sure they survived, people who were sure that they didn't, and we try to give kind of both sides to it. And then, But really, uh, we're trying to tell a story, too. So for me, I'm not trying to be the, uh, the definitive answer on anything. I'm trying to right. tell a compelling, fun story. And so we put in the details that make sense. We try to make it in a way that we're as accurate as we can be. If we don't know something, we try to make it clear, you know, what we do and what we don't know. And then you try to weave that into something that in 15 minutes is just fun to listen to. And that is a, that's a fun story. It's an interesting story. I, I, don't, I mean, after looking, I think uh, that they probably died in Bolivia. That's what most historians think. But I mean, the evidence to prove that is truly missing. And so it makes for a really wonderful mystery. Yeah. All right, for our audience though, let's please introduce yourself. We want to put a plug in for your show, which obviously we're fans of. So tell us a little bit about your show and how where we can see it and all that. Okay, well, the show's called The History Guy. History deserves to be remembered. Uh, it's on YouTube. Uh, we will be producing podcasts soon, but the best way to find us is to go search us out on YouTube. We're also on Facebook and Twitter, but that most is going to drive you to the YouTube channel. You know, and, it's uh, an amazing yeah. amount of it. It's an amazing amount of episodes. And you're yeah. doing three a day. Why are you doing three a day? Or three a week. Three a week. Uh, three a week. Well, I mean, partly, you know, to be honest, this is what pays my bills. This pays my mortgage. And so, and YouTube, it's all views. So if you put up more, you do get more views. But we've, we've experimented. I, I was doing a two a week. Uh, and then it started, the channel started making enough that I told my wife, you really don't have to be working there if you don't want to work mm -hmm. there. And so she came and worked for me. She was writing scripts. And so we moved up to three a week. You have that beautiful Cicero quote, to be ignorant of what happened before you were born is to remain a child. Um, in your Cicero story, mm -hmm. I like the Cicero story. You know, um, and why do you think it's important to remember, you know, and, and think about all these people? I think there's, and like you said, I, I like to lead, let the, the viewer kind of divine the lessons and what they get from it, but on every one of them, there's just plenty of lessons to divine. So there's, there's, I think, lots of good reasons, but one of the reasons is it's just interesting stuff. I love telling stories, and we find out we've got so many stories in society, and that's what we do on television, that's what we do in the theater, uh, and some of the stories in history are just more fantastic than anything that you see in fiction, and so for some reason, it's just reason to remember it just because it's a good story to listen to, but it also, I mean, it, it, it helps us kind of understand who we are and how we got here and helps us better understand things that are going on in the present. I mean, those are, those are meaningful and it's, it's a human story and really how we put things together. So uh, we've got a couple of episodes that we did on the, the uh, Spanish influenza, the pandemic in 1918. Uh, and so I, one of the things about, if you look at 1918 and 1919, <laughs> I mean, the Spanish influenza, which was some 10 times as deadly as COVID was going on during the first world war. Yeah. Uh, and, I mean, so we weren't even listening to the epidemic because of, because of the war. Uh, and if you survived 1918 and 1919 into 1920, you know, the president had a stroke. And we essentially didn't have a president for 19 months. And we had uh, uh, the, the, the racial tensions of the day were much more brutal than today. Hundreds of people were being killed in what they called the Red Summer in 1919. If you lived through those years, then you would look at how upset we are about being locked in our homes for COVID. And you would kind of laugh. And, you know, at, at, I mean, life is so much easier now. Uh, and that's not to downplay COVID. It's to say that uh, it, it, it helps to understand that we didn't do worse and that we survived, that we were still, you know, humans are still kicking, uh, and we will still be kicking 100 years from now, and it'll be interesting to see 100 years from now how we talk about what's going on today, uh, but I don't think what we'll be saying it's as bad as it was 100 years ago, and that's a good reason to learn things, to say that, you know, we're, we'll, we'll make it through. Are you your, know, we, in your story, are your, are you, are your interests changing during COVID? Are you finding more need to connect to things that are happening around us right now? Like, like you just said. I, 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 we always have to an extent, uh, but uh, uh, and the, the the original episode I did on the Spanish influenza was was in 2018 because it was the hundred year it was the hundred year anniversary of it, the centenary of it. So you know, I had no idea that COVID was coming. But since COVID, especially when people started to be uh, quarantined and at home, we did do a few things that were relevant to COVID, and we also we did a contract with the History Channel to do some episodes uh, aimed at children, which is something we'd never done before. Uh, and they asked us to do things that were relevant to COVID. And so we chose some topics that were relevant to COVID there too. We talked about things like the hospital ships or the history of soap. 
but I mean, so we've always tried to be relevant and, uh, but uh, yeah, there's some, I mean, people are thinking about it now and we did some things that were sort of tangentially related to it. Uh, but I don't talk current events. I try and try very hard not to talk current events, uh, but that doesn't mean I can't talk about historical events that are sometimes surprisingly similar to current events. What you about know, the after... lobster? Oh, sorry, Jesse. Sorry. I got to know the lobster though. I'm just like the lobster episode. What, my, 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 my son wrote that lobster episode. I have no idea how he came up with, I mean, we've done all sorts of things though. We've talked about dandelions or peanuts or cranberries. Uh, and those are, uh, they're all interesting really in their way. So uh, I don't know why he got onto writing the, the lobster episode, but it's really kind of interesting to see, you know, we think of it as something like if you've got a really fancy date night, you'll go out for lobster. Uh, and our ancestors thought, well, if I got nothing to eat, I'll go down to the beach and pick up these things and eat them because they've got nothing else to eat. So it's really interesting to see how it's changed. It was a great episode. Great. But I, uh, Josh wrote that one. I don't know. I don't know where he got the topic. I mean, we get them. Uh, one day I was sitting in my basement. And I said, what am I going to write on? And uh, the guy we paid to mow the lawn mowed by. And I said, I wonder who invented the lawnmower. And then, you know, that's been a very popular episode. And uh, that's, I mean, sometimes we just stumble on them and they're, they're fun to talk about. I, so, I happened to be at the optometrist last week, and I was wondering what the gizmo was that you put your face into, and uh, that led to the episode that we put up today on the history of eye correction. But now, like, say you get interested in that, how do you how do you do the research on eye correction? Like, where do you even start? You know, well, I mean, mostly we research online because we have to turn over episodes very quickly, and you just mm -hmm. you get very good at Google. <laughs> and uh, but we do a lot of times we start at Wikipedia. I mean, I know it's a it's kind of a dangerous place, Wikipedia. But uh, mm -hmm. uh, first of all, we know there's going to be pictures there, and they're going to tell you if they're in the public domain, which is really helpful for me. But uh, it will also sometimes get you going different directions. You know the um, the uh, I forget his name. The he was a he was a, a you know did uh, World War One. He was a, a total hero. Did incredible heroic things on the battlefield, and then he landed on a plane in the Pacific. Yeah, that's Eddie he, Rickenbacker. Yeah, he was our number one flying ace in the First World War. Yeah, uh, he, he bought the Indianapolis Speedway. He uh, started Eastern Airlines. Uh, he was in his 50s, and uh, FDR asked him if he would go do a tour of uh, the Pacific bases. And on the way there, his B-17 got lost, and they crashed in the ocean, and they were in the ocean for, I think, 41 days. Am I right? I might be wrong on the number of days. It was, it was not quite a record because of two other sailors who was, whose plane had gone down, two other Navy guys whose plane had gone down just a little bit earlier. But it was nearly a record for time alone in a lifeboat. It's a really incredible story. Uh, and uh, it's just amazing at his age, he's the one that kind of kept them all, he's in there with, you know, mostly soldiers, mostly our pilots and people younger than him. He's the one that kept them all together and alive. And they managed to all get out alive, uh, except for one, one guy died in the boat. But. You know, um, uh, it struck me as so interesting that he had one form of, her, you know, being a hero in the, in the war, and then he had another form of being a hero in the, the you know, what makes a hero? You know, what, what was it about him that, that, uh, you know, made him have those qualities. And, and he showed that in other ways too, Ed. He was in a fairly a significant plane wreck at Eastern too and helped save some lives. I mean, uh, sometimes people just I, I have the quality. I mean, when he, when he went to fly in the First World War, he was already a race car driver. And if you're a race car driver of the era, if you saw, I mean, these things were, you know, open wheel race cars going 100 miles an hour. You weren't afraid of anything. And he always thought they would be good pilots because they're used to being shoved in a small cockpit and going fast and they're not afraid of crashing. Uh, mm -hmm. And so I think he was, you know, fearless before he ever got into the airplane in the First World War. And I think that that was part of it. But I mean, maybe all those life experiences together, or maybe he was, he was just born that way. It's a, it's a really difficult question of what is heroism and what's truly heroic, because we get a lot of discussion of that on the channel. But it's also difficult to answer why, why do some people just lend themselves to heroics? And he showed that again and again, Eddie Rickenbacker, really an amazing fellow. Uh, um, but I did, think there was her heroism in his wife as, as well. I mean, this, you know, she, she was older than him. She was a widow. They had been married that long. But it was really her force of will that kept them looking for them and, that, and found them. And I, I find a lot of heroism in that. You know, is, does a country need a collective memory to, to sort of understand those things? Because we don't, we don't see those people. And we don't have a, a, a tacit feeling about them at the moment. And, and maybe we're forgetting something important. I, I think so. And, and it's one of the interesting things about that. I mean, I learn every time I put up an episode, we're putting up so many episodes. And I understand when people say to me, why didn't I learn this when I was studying in school? Well, if you're trying to understand the broad specter of history and the broad scope of history, you can't really talk about every individual. You got to pick the individuals that you talk about. It leaves out so many people. 
And that's too bad because you know what I try to do is to make it more personal and to tell it as a story that it, it, you know, it might be it might be humorous, it might be dramatic, uh, it, but uh, it might just really be touching. But th those stories are what make us understand history: is that these are people just like us who just lived through extraordinary times, which you know we are as well. And so I agree. Yeah, I think that uh, that you, having a, a shared understanding of who we are as a people or who we are as a nation, or uh, I think those really do help us understand, especially in a very divided time that you know. Right. Uh, we're all really still people, yeah. we're all still facing situations like people always have. And, and the question of the future is going to be what we did when we faced the situations today. You know, I, um, have, a, I have a question around that because what, first of all, in, in many places, there's what we call revisionist history, right? There's like, what, what is history is, again, to my first question, the subjective nature of it. And mm -hmm. do you feel now, I mean, even with the story of the Black Swallow, like the, the A, what is the response? And how important is it to also think about the diversity of the stories that we're telling so that it really does have an impact right now in, in where we're all struggling, as Jesse was saying, I mean, we're struggling for a memory of who we are. And some of it's not great. We have to look at it. Mm -hmm. How do you think about all that? I, I think, I mean, and this is part of the nature of the channel is that we'll talk about anything uh, and uh, on any time period. I mean, Eugene Millard is, is so really interesting uh, and I, it is important to talk about the fact that he was he was African American. He was he was a Native American, and and, and he still ended up in the end just being very patriotic to be an American. Uh, but I, I think that's a lot to his story. But there's certainly more to the story than the color of his skin. But you can't remove that from the story because that's the reason that that he wasn't put into the Air Force until 50 years after his death, when they finally decided that he could be a, in the United States Air Force posthumously. Uh, so I, I think that a variety of stories, uh, some of them hopeful, some of them dramatic, some of them traumatic, uh, and uh, all really do help us uh, understand it's all important. It's important that we see all sides of that. Uh, and so we talk about terrible things that have happened in the United States and terrible things that have been done is, uh, on behalf of the United States. But we also talk about uh, uh, you know, great things that have happened in the United States and a lot of stuff that's in between. And, and it, all, it all says that uh, it, Again, you know, every day, you know, we don't know always what's right and wrong. We certainly don't know what's going to be right and wrong in historical perspective. And, and that's why it's important to look back and say, you know, those challenges have always been here. We, we've always had to face those challenges. Uh, you know, but when you talk about revisionist history, I mean, you know, history changes. We learn things as we go along. So it's also important that we talk about, you know, how we understood these things maybe differently even 10 years ago or 50 years ago, or, you know, why people didn't talk about Eugene Ballard in 1918, but we're willing to talk about him in, in 2020. Um, what, do you feel the same way about um, uh, Mary uh, Edwards Walker? Edwards Walker, yeah, she's, she's an interesting story. Uh, and, it, you know, that was one of those where, I mean, in 10 or 15 minutes, I couldn't really give the whole breadth of her story or fascinating story about why she was given the Medal of Honor, why the Medal of Honor was taken away, why the Medal of Honor was eventually returned. Uh, but, I mean, she's another great question about what, you know, what makes a hero. Because uh, if you look at it, the, the real reason she was given a Medal of Honor was that she wanted to have a position in the Army Medical Corps. And she had some very powerful people, including Lincoln, who supported her. Uh, and, uh, but the Army Medical Corps did not want her to have a position in the Army Medical Corps, and they couldn't really fight them. So when it came to after the war, and she's got people pushing on her side, and she, uh, she's really looking for a job, because as a, as a female doctor, you, you no know, one wanted to go to a female doctor, so she couldn't make a living. Uh, so she was looking for a job in the army. They couldn't give her a job in the army. They couldn't overcome the medical corps' objection, but they still wanted to reward her somehow. And so they gave her a medal of honor. So she doesn't have like most medal of honor winners. Certainly not all. When you when you understand what happened to the Miles Commission, but she didn't have like most medal of honor. She doesn't have the this is the heroic act for which she was given the medal of honor. She was really given the medal of honor because as a female, she couldn't be given the normal credit that she should have gotten as a, as a brave, loyal doctor during the the, the war. And so they gave it to her instead. And that leaves a really interesting question about, is she truly a hero? Did she truly deserve that medal? And how much do we consider the fact uh, that she was doing what everybody else did, but she was doing it in the face of so much other things because of her gender? Uh, how much does that figure in? And it makes for a compelling and interesting question. So I, I think that what she did was amazing. And certainly you know, that, that she would go behind enemy lines at risk of her life and limb to deliver a baby when the other doctors there wouldn't do that. I mean, I think that's quite heroic. Uh, but the question of, you know, is she a Medal of Honor winner? Well, she is a Medal of Honor uh, recipient, but uh, now it's been returned to her. You know, the question is, you know, is it there with what other Medal of Honor recipients did? That's a, that's a different question. I mean, in my mind, she's a hero, but I can certainly see the argument that's made, you know, on the other side. And 
that's one of the interesting things about history. Lance, question for you. Uh, Jesse's doing his research in real time. So okay. what I think is really interesting is like, you have so many, like you said, you're putting out multiple you know, episodes, but in, in terms of the context, like, do we have to balance just consuming things in small pieces? Because all of your stories uh, demand us then to go and kind of dig deeper and understand context. Because certainly in this day and age, people are losing context and then they just take something verbatim and they don't really understand and then they extrapolate. And now you're having people throwing ideas around at each other. How important is, you know, we, we come, we get excited about an, you know, a story that you're presenting. And then what about follow-up? What about the deeper context? How about reading, you know, how important is the rest of it? Because what you're doing is really tantalizing us and getting us excited and interested. But what is the work for the rest of us moving forward? I, think, and I, I hope it spurs people to do more research. And I, I hope that people go, and we get a lot of people who say that. I mean, the goal really of each episode is to tell a compelling story and to tell enough of a complete story that if you watch the episode, you come around away with things you didn't know before and, and, and an understanding of kind of the events. So I, I hope that people go research more, but I, I hope it's also not required because I also want it to be entertaining. I mean, there, uh, I understand because I have a degree in history that, that history is really important in the broad themes. And that you really, I mean, when I studied history in college, uh, we didn't talk about the Civil War. You talk about what led to the Civil War. You talk about what resulted from the Civil War, but you don't care about the battle strategies. Those aren't really relevant to the broader story of history. Uh, whereas if you are a hobby historian, then you really want to know who put what gun where and why that made a difference in the battle. And so we're kind of in between, but I understand that the, the medium that I have chosen uh, is not going to be a place where I can, I, I couldn't do a 50 minute episode and tell you, oh, this is the Civil War. This is the, the Civil War. Uh, so I, I think that what we do adds humanity to the broader themes. Uh, but I really leave it up to other channels to provide the broader theme. So we do have a lot of people who say, I really researched this and I want to understand that and I, and I am, that are really taught me what I have to learn more. But I think that we have lots of people, hundreds of thousands of people who watch our episodes and that's, that's all that they watch of it. And if, if they're entertained and if they learn something and if it gives them a better understanding of, of, of how real history can be, then that's, that's uh, good as well. Where, you, where does your curiosity come from? I where's mean, my curiosity come from? Yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, I've always, I've always loved history. I can't remember when I didn't uh, love history. Uh, I have, uh, let's say, Tennyson's poem, The Charge of Light Brigade. That is in my head. I cannot remember when I memorized it. I don't, I can't remember a time when I did not know by heart The Charge of the Light Brigade. Uh, and so I, it's kind of hard to say, but I can say that my, my father uh, uh, was, uh, he was in the Forest Service. He was a civil servant. But when I grew up, the TV was always playing either a John Wayne movie or something like War at Sea or, or Combat. Or, I mean, so I grew up on World War II and Westerns uh, is really what I grew up on. And I, and I guess that's where the passion came from. I, I, don't, I don't really, I can't say here's the defining moment when I said this is what I wanted to do. But I mean, it's not what I did for a long time. For a long time, I mean, I, I was in the corporate world. I taught, when I taught at university, I did not, I wasn't teaching history. I was teaching speech communication. But I was always, everywhere you go, I was always telling stories about history. I mean, that's when, when you got me away from whatever I was doing, that's what I would, would do is talk about the stories. Some of them I wasn't getting quite right is what I've learned as the history guy. <laughs> I was telling this great story. And then when I went and researched it, I went, ah, I wasn't quite accurate on yeah. that. But uh, people would always say, you should do that for a living. And I would be like, oh, that'd be great. If I had any idea how you could make a living doing that, I would do it. And you know, it wasn't until I was 52 that I figured out how to, how to do it. And now I really enjoy it. So I, I, part of it, I guess, was I didn't do that. I did other things, and that, that helped me really realize what I really love doing. Did you, um, do you think of John Ford as like a, a Virgil or, you know, that kind of character? Is he our, is he well, our amazing? John Ford is so epic, you know, and, and he gives you such a, I mean, there's no historical accuracy in almost anything that John Ford did. But, uh, uh, but he, he really gave you this vision that history is romantic. Uh, and to me, that does, that is a, that is a Virgil sort of thing. That gives you the broad story, you know, it's, it's I think Virgil was, you know, made up too, or, or Homer. Uh, it gives you maybe the heroic story, but it gives you the, the reason to feel like this is worth investigating. Uh, and you find out that, you know, if you go out there and find the real story, sometimes they're even more interesting than the, than the plot lines that they did, though most of them didn't have the backdrop of, you know, Monument Valley. You know, it is, it is interesting how war films are usually a reflection about how we feel about the country at a certain time. So you have John Ford doing that, and then you have Oliver Stone telling us that the leader of the platoon is trying to kill everybody in the platoon. It's like a different perspective at a different time. 
Yeah, I mean, history is that way. I mean, it tends to, we call it historiography, the changing history, or we talk about revisionist history, some of that's that we've learned more and some of that we just see it from a different viewpoint. But uh, when, his, when history is written, it is usually written in the context of what's going on at the time. And that's really interesting because it changes, especially older history. It really does change with time. And that is true of media as well, certainly true of movies. So there's, I mean, I, I can say as, 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 as just a history buff, not necessarily tending to be a, a professional historian, it's a history buff, buff. Most of what we see in the movies about history is not very accurate. I mean, it doesn't, even, doesn't look like it. That's not how things were. That's not even that the, they get the story wrong. But I mean, they get the whole idea of what was going on at the time wrong. Uh, and because, you know, we're, we're telling stories for different reasons. Uh, but uh, uh, still, when that gives you that, the passion for it, and then you can go and see what it was really like, then that can, that can be really fascinating. And so, it, I mean, the, the two kind of go together. But you're right. I mean, uh, it, it, whatever war movie uh, is up today is probably representing something about what the country thinks about uh, the country today and might say a lot more about the country today than it says about uh, the country when the, you know, when the events occurred that the, that the movie's trying to show. You know, do you um, do you ever read Shelby Foote or any of those kinds? Of, do you read a lot of literature as well as the research uh, I, online? I have to say, since I started doing this, I read a lot less just because we're doing so many episodes. I don't have time to read, but I do. I like a lot of historical fiction. I'm a big fan of Bernard Cornwell uh, uh, and uh, 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 O'Brien. Uh, and there's, I mean, there's a few of them that are just a lot of fun. <laughs> How often um, do you have to write episodes every day? Do you write uh, every day? We got about two days to put up an episode. So if, if, uh, if in a given week, if, if my son writes one of the scripts, and then I'm writing two other scripts, then that fills up five days worth of time to get them out. And so it's, and that's, that's kind of, you, you, work, you put your heart into one, you learn everything about it, you talk, I get, I get, what my wife mostly does is hear me talk about how excited I am about whatever's going up tomorrow. Yeah. You put it up. Now you wait a half hour to see everything you got wrong because they're immediately going to figure that out. And then you have to write that into the description or, you know, pin comment. I got this wrong yeah. or that wrong. Uh, and then by afternoon, you're on a whole other topic. And two days later, you're putting up another one. And that's, that's so, kind of an interesting life. So you write a whole script and then mm -hmm. you edit the script. And then is there somebody there? Do you edit the movies yourself? Yeah, I do it all myself. Yeah, I, wow. I, I'm right where I'm sitting now. This is where I film it. Uh, yeah. And my only production assistant is uh, assistant is the cat who lays there, who who I have to tickle her feet sometimes if she's snoring too loud. Uh, and then uh, I, I edit them. I use a program that's called Power Director. I do it on a laptop, so I edit them mm -hmm. myself, and I I put them out myself. So and, the, and where do you? Yeah. Uh, someone might write a script, but everything else I do. And then do you just have know where all these images are, where you can find you know a picture of you know Big Nose Kate and. All this yeah, stuff. I mean, I mean, after you do it a while, you certainly learn how to troll the web, and I and I think I have a good understanding of what's in the public domain and where to find stuff. And yeah. so, I mean, that was the hardest part at first, uh, and uh, it's still uh, I spend about as much time finding pictures and media and films that 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 we can legally use uh, as I spend writing a script. Uh, but uh, it's a lot easier now, certainly, than when I first started because I I found out all these little corners of the web where people hide things, and then you can use them, and it's surprising what you find out and how to find stuff in the National Archives, which is not always easy to do, but sometimes there's some really amazing stuff in there. And, and then I'll be researching one thing and I'll find out, oh, in this newsreel, there was something else in there and I'll set that aside. And it, you know, it, it gets easier with time. You but know, so, um, if, you do a, if you do a story on um, Gotti, is it harder mm -hmm. to find those images? You know? Well, it's, in some ways that's easy because, or easier because we formed a really cool relationship with the Mob Museum in Las Vegas Right. Uh, and they've got tons of images and they've got Gotti's, you know, underwear or whatever. They've got all his, you know, if, if he's an important mobster, they've got pieces of his stuff. Uh, and so we just coordinate with them and we put them at the end and they send us pictures. So some of it's, some of that's actually kind of easier. Uh, and then it depends if it's prior to 1925 when stuff is in public domain, it's a lot easier for us to find pictures. We can use newspapers and stuff from the period. Uh, uh, or if it's uh, something, anything, say, U.S. military, then anything that um, an agent of the U.S. government does uh, as part of their job is in the public domain. But there's, there's others. Like I did one on the, uh, uh, the, the New York City blackout. Well, it was everything in there would have been something that was, say, an AP picture. And those I don't have rights to. Right. And to pay for the rights is more than I'm ever going to make off the episode. So we just can't yeah. afford to go buy, say, Getty Images. Uh, and so if you watch that episode, which is, I think, really a, a fascinating episode, if you watch really carefully, you'll see that I use a lot of public domain images of thunderstorms, uh, but there's not a single image in there of any of the actual events. I mean, I, ah. just, I, had, I had no pictures of the riots. I had no pic yeah. I, so I'm just, I'm taking, you know, generic 1970s pictures of New York and, and yeah. pictures of lightning. Uh, yeah. And we can do an episode on that sometimes. 
So, yeah. uh, Lance, very important question for you. You know, kind of our final question. Tell me about the bow tie. Like, where, oh. where do they yeah, come it's from? Honestly, it's a coincidence. When I, when I first thought of the channel, um, I did know I wanted to be a little dressier than most people are on YouTube. And uh, that was just kind of a feeling of what it's like to present. But I also kind of had in my mind that, you know, when you have these old dusty documentaries, there's always some professor sitting with all these books behind him. And, and he's like, you know, and I kind of wanted to be that guy. But I didn't have the bow tie in mind at all. I just happened to know how to tie a bow tie and have worn them in the past. So if you watch the first, say, several episodes back in early 17, I had some without ties, I had some with overhand ties, and I just one day I put on a bow tie that I had in my drawer, and someone said, and I probably had a hundred, you know, subscribers at the time, and someone said, that's awesome, you got to wear the bow ties. Uh, and so I started, and then they just became a thing, you can't not, not wear the bow ties. And now uh, there's a really great bow tie maker called the Tie Bar, and they send me free bow ties as long as I just put into my uh, into, into my uh, comment section that that they gave me the bow tie and put a link to their thing. And so now I have a bow tie hookup, and so I don't know if I'll ever be without a bow tie. Uh, we even have a custom somewhere I've got it here, a custom history guy bow tie that's uh, not silk screen; it's all stitched in. I got my own bow tie, so it. And so I have. Uh, I don't know if you can see them here. If I can make it so that you can see the bow tie drawer, but I mean, oh, wow. A, if we could down here where you hey, wait, yeah, bring a few out just so we can see and go in. A, go, we'll end on a bow tie here. So, and I, I know I'm using them in a rack. I know I'm using them wrong, but oh, I keep wow. them here. And every episode, I got to figure out what's the right bow tie to right. wear. I just want to say, I just want to say, I am impressed. You actually tie them so they're not the clip on that, no, that not, I bought for my son. I, I've worn a couple of clip ons because a viewer sent them to me and said, you know, my grandfather left this to me. And so oh, I wow. felt like, you know, I should, I should inspect them. But, no, I, in general, I, I tie my own bow ties. It's, it's the same knot used to tie your shoe. So if you can tie your shoe, you can figure out how to tie a bow tie. You just have to kind of remember that it's the same knot. Um, well, we have a lot to watch now. A lot yeah. to catch up on. I mean, Jesse's, I think, seen every episode. I'm a little behind him, but uh, yeah, I think it's wonderful. There's, Keep there's going. A of, you have a few to write. Cause you gotta, I, you I haven't seen every one, but I've seen a lot. I do quite enjoy them. And just, you know, thank you so much for spending some time with us. This was really... Uh, this was really fantastic. I really appreciate yeah. it. And this thank you. Yeah. I'm, I'm so impressed to hear that you're fans. So I'm, I, I love your show too. And thank you for having me on. This is a great yeah. time. Anytime. I'd, I'd love to talk about what I do, uh, if you yeah. can help. Thank okay. you. Get back to work because I'm sure thank I know you. you're working. I got to have an episode thank up on Friday. We're talking about dinosaurs on Friday. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, you're definitely not going to have any footage for that, you know? Well, but there's lots of public domain images of fake dinosaurs. So that's, yeah. that's it's easy. Yeah. That's, Okay. Okay. Have a good day. Thank you, Lance. Wow. I am, uh, I'm exhausted. There's so much history. There's a lot going on. There's a lot to be discovered there. Yeah, he was great. You know what I mean? Yeah, but I want to know how you actually found him originally. I don't know. We just found him, but he's, he's really fantastic. He has so much to say. He's brilliant. You know, yeah. uh, that was that was great. I mean, he has so many episodes. It, it is kind of crazy. And as I started to watch them, but I have to say, I have a pension for a lobster. So I was just like, of course, <laughs> he from his, that was his son. All right. Yeah. Well, it, we're slackers, okay, compared to him. We have a Absolutely. lot of work to do. And uh, okay. we're going to talk about our next episode. All right. See you later. See you in the next one. Bye. All right. Bye.